that's a, a striking example of science as not being objective, but as actually taking an active role in public policy. And it's funny that at my institution, they teach about those scientists as kind of the pinnacle of public servants, that science should be that way, and it should follow their model. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that as a model of um, objective research. We have two ideas on that. Can we evaluate submitted papers and compare their content to published papers to see like how much of the changes are after the refereeing process and the editing process? And the other would be to try to try to look at working papers that have yet to be published and see if their content difference uh, differs. Um, that's going to be challenging to do, but we, we have some ideas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parker. I'm Robert Hall. I'm a first year PhD in biology here at Stanford. I also graduated last year from UW-Madison with majors in genetics and history. All right. So my question is um, about animal biobanking, actually, which is the cryopreservation of animal cells and DNA for conservation by being wedded to molecular reproductive technologies. The chair of genetics at UW-Madison is Francisco Pellegri, and along with Paul Robbins at the Nelson, He's eager to start animal biobanking, especially in the Great Lakes and with wolves too. And I wonder what your opinions on animal biobanking are because it seems to kind of represent some of these innovative technologies of the future. Um, and even with Francisco's message, which is to biobank species long before collapse, um, which exists at the opposite end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. say of like George Church and de-extinction with the mammoth, there seems to be a big tension between conservationists in general and accepting or even being willing to talk about these innovative technologies. And I wonder why that, why you think that is. Yeah, some of the concerns remind me of concerns people have about GMOs um, uh, generally. I, I guess I would say just, you know, so what's, what's the economic argument for preservation of species that don't have known current value, uh, or that have negative known value. So wolves were a giant nuisance to societies for centuries, which is why they were eliminated. Um, other species, like vultures, uh, their value is kind of unknown in the present, and science is starting to reveal it. And so uh, in economics, we call it option value. So why would we preserve something? Uh, with known with no little known value. Well, it gives us the option to exploit its value in the future if it later becomes revealed or, or evident. And so, you know, bio banking of that sort um, preserves that option in a pretty clear way, um, but it's not without costs. So, you know, I think what one would try to do is think about the costs and benefits. Benefits are gonna be hard to measure because it is that option. Um, and, and the cost will be a little bit clearer. Uh, and then, you know, on long-term planning uh, programs like that, you know, so much of the evaluation hinges on um, how much you discount the future, uh, how much weight you put on the future versus the present, and also um, uh, how much, you know, how risk averse societies are. So these, these are tough problems. I haven't formed a real specific opinion about that. I mean, you, you, you know, the, the species reintroductions that I talked about are species that were driven locally uh, extinct, but they weren't globally extinct. Um, but, you know, there's, there's attempts to maybe restore the woolly, woolly mammoth and such. So uh, I'm happy to talk more about that and happy to, there's someone from Madison here. Good morning, my name is Amy Wong. I'm a rising senior at UCLA. My question is pertaining to the machine learning models you used for your research. I was wondering if you, or the graduate student who really is interested in these uh, machine learning models, if you either considered making it public and or teaching others how to use these models, because I think that you know, as these articles be continue to be published, of course, I would think it would be a pretty insightful and an intellectually stimulating exercise for the public to be able to use these models to kind of like not fact check these, articles, but to kind of see the subject, subjectivity and objectivity 
uh, levels of these different articles. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, well, thanks for that. So um, replication is critical. Easy replication is critical for the advancement of science. And so those norms have been improving, um, certainly in economics, where 20 years ago you could do an empirical paper and the data set would only be available if the, um, if the authors chose to share it with you. Now, as a prerequisite to being published, um, you have to make the data and the code available. And then journals also employ an auditor who will make sure that your code produces the results that are in the paper. And so certainly, um, when, and, when and if this paper gets published, um, we would want to make everything available for, um, for people to replicate and to use. And this is a product that has, um, unlike some of the other data sets I've worked with, the code here has a lot of potential public value. Um, and so we would, want, we would want it to be used. I mean, one possibility is for it to be used specifically as a tool in the editorial process. Um, and I talked with some of my colleagues about um, this project, and they said, yeah, you know, we, we mentor graduate students, um, and, you know, they write a certain way, and their, their model looks really good, their empirical analysis looks sound. Uh, but, like, there's so many wording changes I want to do, I feel like I've got to rewrite the paper. And so, like, some of this gets through just because, you know, it's costly to edit and change, and even ref referees don't want to do that. Referees look at your model, they don't look as much at your words. So, like, some tool that could improve the communication, because if, if people in the media, you know, if people contact me from the media about my papers, you know, if you use uh, subjective language, they're, they're going to use it, you know? And if they use, if they describe your objective research in a way that you don't consent to, at least you have a, you know, at least you can say, well, that, that was their assessment of my work. I, I wouldn't characterize it that way. So I think tool will be valuable in a lot of ways. Hi, my name is Wilson He. I'm a recent graduate of Yale. My question is regarding the uh, the links between federal funding and how that's uh, given out in grants or other means from groups like the National Science Foundation or others to researchers for environmental economics and, envir and environmental science. I'm wondering if it's possible, if that is a big funding source for this research, that Congress or those who oversee grants could put m more money towards to incentivize uh, objective research and disincentivize subjective wording and things of that nature. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for that question. We had, um, maybe we're in the process of doing this, but we are, we are trying to add a data point that describes the funding of the research. So if you publish a paper, typically you disclose where funding came from. And so this is a little, little twist on your question, I think, and it's, um, but the, the twist on your question is maybe, maybe funding sources would lead to more subjective language in a paper or be correlated with it, um, depending on who the funder is, including the federal government. I mean, there's pressures on, for example, if we do more research on wolves, we're going to be, there's going to be oversight from the organizations that have information, the, the government agencies that have information on um, a wolf predation of livestock, right? And so, um, and if you use federal government data, a lot of times you, they're, they're required to review your paper before you can get it published. So federal funding is often a constraint on academic liberty, actually, in that way, certainly if they're the data providers. But, you know, you could flip that script, perhaps, and, um, and government could be you know, in principle, objectivity is a big public good. And what's the economic role of government is one big role is to support the provision of pure public goods that we wouldn't expect the private sector to provide. And this, this would be one great example of that. Hello. Uh, thank you for the lecture. It has been very interesting. Uh, my question is with regards to um, the development of uh, environmental pollution in the U.S. Do you think that, it, that the cause of it has been either um, active government uh, involvement in these issues or that it has been the result of unintended uh, human action um, in terms of uh, air quality or uh, environmental pollution in the U.S. at least? Thank you. Both. 
I mean, both. Governments have, government action has helped improve environmental quality and government action has interfered with um, uh, environmental quality. And so it, it's pretty case specific. Um, you know, I showed you improvements in clean air uh, in that, I mean, I think that's a pretty clean result, <laughs> no pun intended, of um, uh, federal legislation before that state legislation. So, you know, uh, uh, the Clean Air Act was important, especially the amendments in 1990 that involved a lot of economic incentives that allowed power plants to trade with each other and reduce the cost of lowering SO2. Um, so, so government involvement that incorporates incentives, that includes markets, um, has proven to be pretty helpful. I mean, a contrast is with the Clean Water Act, which has um, been less successful in the sense that it, in many ways, the costs are greater than the benefits of the Clean Water Act. Um, the Federal Clean Water Act came after many states were already locally regulating water quality, and the improvements were due to state action, not really to federal action. And then the Clean Federal Clean Water Act disallowed trading. It still disallows trading. So the key source of lowering the cost of reducing air pollution under the Federal Clean Air Act is, is, is trading markets. And that's disallowed under the Clean Water Act. And so um, government action can, can be quite critical in improving environmental quality, but especially if it incorporates economic incentives. Um, one other example of, of this is the U.S. Endangered Species Act, which um, is strong legislation. It, it means you can't take harm or otherwise damage an endangered species if it's found to be on uh, land, including private property. And so if an endangered species might inhabit your private property, and it's known to be there by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, you will be regulated as a private landowner and a lot of your choices will be constrained. You can't develop, you might not be able to cut trees, um, and this has caused some landowners to treat endangered species as an enemy rather than a friend because it could affect their economic livelihood. So one example is the red cockaded woodpecker in North Carolina. It requires old growth pine trees to, to, to nest in and um, uh, that's a lot of that uh, pine is found on private land. If private landowners thought that the woodpecker might move to their land, they have, they have been found to preemptively cut wood to harvest to destroy their habitat so that they wouldn't be regulated if the animal did come and reside on their property. Well, that's a perverse incentive to do the very thing, to, to work against the very point of the act, which is to conserve habitat. Loss of habitat's a big threat um, to species. And so um, if the Endangered Species Act ignores the incentives it creates, some perverse, it's not going to be very effective in conserving wildlife. And so there's been amendments to the act that have addressed this problem. Hi, uh, my name is Ethan, and I had a question about scientists as uh, like activists versus being objective. So there's a very famous example of, I think, the ozone layer problem where, I, I don't remember the names of the scientists, but they published a paper, and they were the ones that originally found that the ozone layer was being depleted, and then that spiraled into eventually international action on that environmental problem. But as you were talking, it made me think about like how that's a, a striking example of science as not being objective, but is actually taking an active role in public policy. And it's funny that at my institution, they teach about those scientists as kind of the pinnacle of public servants, that science should be that way, and it should follow their model. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that as a model mm -hmm. of um, objective research. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, good question. Um, I mean, I guess the, the first thing I would ask, because I'm trained to ask this, is what's the counterfactual? So, like, if they didn't take this advocacy role, would their would their research still have the same impact? And that was one of the reasons I presented um, two of my papers that I, I tried to actively stay out of this um, activist role, advocacy role, and the and the papers still 
got a lot of play and they still were discussed in policy circles. I was invited to testify before Congress and so it still happens. So is the counterfactual look, what does the counterfactual look like? And second, I would say that um, surely, as you point out, there are good examples of scientists becoming directly involved in policies and good things happening as a result. Um, uh, if scientists took that on as, as their main role, uh, my sense is the overall risk is going to be greater than the benefits, although there'll be some individual cases where good things happen. Thank you. Thank you.